In this lesson, we're going to move on from talking about the era of Thatcher governments, and we're going to start to talk about the, the, the push towards a new consensus. And this means we're going to examine the period of time under which we see the governance of uh, John Major and John Major's governments. And that's what we're going to focus on in this lesson and in the next uh, four or five-ish um, lessons in the future. So we've explored the fall and the legacy of Thatcher in the previous two lessons, and now we're going to examine the next of our British Prime Ministers to take office during the 1990s, that being John Major. Now, there will be a number of domestic and international crises that take place during the major governments, and we will see just how influential these are when it comes to um, conflict within the Middle East, conflict in, in, in Bosnia and, and the Balkans, as well as internal crises, including um, the troubles with the IRA, uh, continu a continuation of the troubles of IRA. So... Beginning then, let's talk about the aims of John Major as Prime Minister. He wanted to unite Britain under a new form of consensus. He saw that there was a lot of division uh, uh, under the remit when it comes to the legacy of Thatcher. There's a lot of division uh, and a lot of conflict between people within Great Britain itself. And so they are, there ought to be a uniting of Great Britain under this new consensus, under a new leader. We now remove this very, um, th th this very controversial leader who was hated by some and loved by others and now we've got this uh, leader who wants to unite the world but on top of that he also wants to continue the work of thatcher so in terms of actual uh, politics and the actual policies that he wants to implement he wants to see himself as continuing the work of margaret thatcher and despite the fact that Major wants to see the continuation, he also wanted to make a number of major changes. Uh, pardon the pun. <laughs> We're talking about major changes. Uh, first of all, uh, we wanted to see a, an increase in the spending for welfare programs, such as the NHS and education, something that he believed was um, underperformed um, in terms of the, the kind of spending that was done under the legacy of Thatcher. And he wants to sign the Maastricht Treaty in 1992. Now, what this does is it shows a closer development with uh, the ties between Great Britain and the European Union. The Maastricht Treaty was one of the uh, major European treaties that takes place. We have the Treaty of Lisbon in 2007. We also have the Treaty of Nice, Treaty of Amsterdam, for example. All of these things further encode and further enshrine certain powers and authority and certain uh, areas of legal regulation that can be um, that can be had under the European Union. And the Maastricht Treaty is one such example of this that took place in 1992. Another thing that he wanted to do was a very um, quick uh, U-turn in terms of the unpopular poll tax. He wanted to repeal and replace the unpopular poll tax, and he did that almost immediately. So we see that Major takes over from Thatcher and he would then win re-election in 1992. But he only wins re-election in 1992 with a very small majority. He has a majority of 22 people or 22 MPs. Um, this is um, something that is not particularly helpful. Um, it is something that's not particularly unexpected. Um, that Major wasn't the kind of brash and bold uh, political figure that Thatcher was. Uh, and also the fact that we've had a conservative government at this point for a very long time. Uh, it meant that there was a certain amount of disdain towards, towards conservative politics at this point. As as what happens when it comes to any political party being in power for a long time. We'll see that this is the case with the Conservatives from the 80s and the 90s. We'll see that this is going to be the case when we look at New Labour from 1997, that they slowly start to lose their popularity as we go up uh, and into 2010 with the, uh, with the coalition. So the... Government itself of 1992 was not help, it didn't help itself either when it came to a number of controversial things that took place. There were a number of sex and corruption scandals that took place. Um, it showed that Major's uh, message of sort of a, a moral value and trying to uh, return back to the basic uh, principles and moral beliefs of the Conservative Party, these ran relatively hollow considering that there was a lot of corruption and scandals taking place. More importantly, in 1992, there were also some economic developments that take place as well that didn't really help uh, matters in the, med in the immediate run, uh, but maybe would have helped in the long run, which we'll get to in a minute. 
The major development of these uh, was the UK's withdrawal from the exchange rate mechanism. So in 1992, sterling was beginning to get sold off. Uh, and when sterling, when any currency gets sold off uh, on, on financial markets, we it sees a reduction in its value. And so initially, the Chancellor tried to maintain the value by dramatically raising interest rates and selling off £30 billion in reserves. Um, this was the initial uh, first step in terms of monetary economics that were attempting to keep the value of sterling as high as possible didn't achieve any expected goals. Therefore, on the 16th of September 1992, we have what is known as Black Wednesday, when Britain would have to withdraw from the exchange rate mechanism. Now, the, the, the ERM withdrawal had a an immediate disaster um, impact on the United Kingdom. It was seen as a disaster straight away. It also increased tensions with the government um, and with Eurosceptics uh, Euro who were becoming more and more disillusioned with membership towards the European Union. Major wanted to see closer ties to the European Union. Major has always been somebody who was not very uh, Eurosceptic at all. He um, was is famously somebody who has gone out against the Brexit referendum and all of the processes that take place of leaving the European Union where, uh, since since he left office. And so, therefore, there is tension that begins to grow when it comes to John Major's relationship with Eurosceptics in his government. In reality, though, in the long run, the, the, the withdrawal from the exchange rate mechanism actually did work to Britain's advantage. While being viewed immediately as a disaster, um, if you take into account the market forces that, uh, that existed at the time, the value of sterling did begin to rise. And in fact, by 1996, it was valued higher than it was when Britain was part of the exchange rate mechanism. So arguably it, it, we would be engaging in in a certain degree of counterfactual history if we suggest that what we by leaving the the, the ERM actually was uh, was better for for the british pound um, than than to remain in it it's impossible to ever know that kind of thing um, but it, it seems to be the case that at least um, withdrawal did uh, eventually in the long run lead to a a stabilization and then also a rise in the value of sterling whether or not it would have risen or stabilized while part of the exchange rate mechanism is a debate for economists, not for historians. Finally, let's talk about the developments that take place when it comes to the Troubles in Northern Ireland. We're starting to see come towards the end of the Troubles in Northern Ireland under John Major and then under Tony Blair. Um, it would still continue to be a large problem for John Major, though, and the majority of his governments. So we have a number of examples of terrorist actions that take place. In 1990, the IRA fires mortars at Downing Street. Luckily, uh, no one was hurt uh, because I believe the mortars landed in the in like the back garden or something of Downing Street. And I'm pretty sure that they were in cabinet at the time of which this attack took place. But despite the fact that no one was hurt, it's another example of a blatant attack on the British government. The fact that they were able to fire mortars at Downing Street it itself is is actually a bit wild, especially given the kind of um, the kind of security uh, apparatus that exists post 9-11. In 1993 as well, we see the IRA bomb a town in Cheshire called Warrington, and this kills two people. And, and just like with the Thatcher governments, John Major made a number of efforts to try and secure a more long-lasting peace. Now, we see a number of different declarations signed, uh, the main one being the 1993 Downing Street Declaration. What the Downing Street Declaration did was make a full assertion that Britain had no selfish interest when it came to relationships with Northern Ireland. And then in 1994, the IRA declared a ceasefire as the negotiator from the United States, George Mitchell, tried to broker a, a, a peace deal. This peace deal, these peace talks would ultimately fall through, but it does show a growing commitment on both sides of this particular conflict to uh, resolve the, 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 the conflict itself and to resolve and to ma maintain and secure a more long-lasting peace. So all of these things build up to the Good Friday Agreement. And I think when we start to look at the historiography of the Good Friday Agreement in future lessons, uh, it's important to note that the Good Friday Agreement didn't come out of nowhere. It was the combination and culmination of a lot of work that took place under uh, under Wilson, under Callaghan, under Thatcher, under uh, Ted Heath, and then also under John Major as well. So all of these things start to build together to form the eventual long-lasting peace that we see in 1998.